we've taken our break at this point, so now we're going to uh, move into law forms. Um, I believe I was able to pull back up all of my definitions via Black's Law. If I am missing one, please bear with me. Uh, we were not prepared for the crash. First law form we want to talk about a little bit is natural law. And many of you are very familiar with natural law. Um, natural law is the basis of, of what we are, our, our law and human nature, the things that we find or discover but are never created for us. And that is, of course, versus uh, positive law. Christian, would you like to expound it? Let's go straight to the definition in Blacks. I like it. Basically, natural law is what's true. Yes. Okay, it's, 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 it's the indisputable truth of the way things work in this universe, and uh, and natural law is, is the law form you want to be operating in, and here's why. This expression, natural law, or jus natural, was largely used in the philosophical, uh, philosophical speculations of the Roman jurists of the Antonian Age, and it and was intended to denote a system of rules and principles for the guidance of human conduct which independently of enacted law enacted law, I'll just stop there for a moment same as positive law, we, we were contrasting this with means law, law that's f created by man Okay, uh, independently of enacted law or of the systems peculiar to any one people might be discovered by the rational intelligence of man so it's what we can rationally discern and will be found to grow out of to out of and conform to his nature, meaning by that word his whole mental, moral, and physical constitution. So it's it's what basically what's true. It's the way Mother Nature works. That's natural law. That's very nice. And we also, you know, I believe, we have a uh, wiki definition. Just real quick, so we get another idea. Natural law or the law of nature, a system of law that is reportedly determined by nature and thus universal. So we won't go too much more into it, but here's two different, uh, you know, two different nice sites for you to take a look at. Um, and positive law or enacted law, as I said, is, is, is man-made law. And whether that's case law or code or any form of man-made law, uh, it's not necessarily true in the same way. Uh, it doesn't necessarily ring true with Mother Nature in the same way. Uh, but it is convention. It brings convention into it. I like the use of the word convention. As well. so, one, common law, of course, which is statutory law, similar to positive law. Um, common law, let's just go for it. I believe I was able to get this one up too. Statutory um, law is one form of positive law. It's not the only form. Common law is a form of positive law as well. Forgive me for a moment. This is one of the ones I wasn't able to get up during the crash. What you're going to see here is common law is essentially uh, the the convention of, of, of court rulings. It's it's uh, it's it, as opposed to statutory or code, which is you can read the rule in a book. Common law is a higher law form. That, that gives way to statute and uh, or makes way for for statute and code, but it's a higher law form that that that, um, uh, that interprets natural law through uh, through cases through histories of cases. Okay, uh, sure. there we go. As that. distinguished, yeah. Why don't you read it? I got some in my throat. Great, right, thank you. As distinguished from Roman law, the modern civil law, the canon law, and other systems. The common law is that body of law and juristic theory which was originated, developed, and formulated, and is administered in England, and has obtained among most of the states and peoples of Anglo-Saxon stock. As distinguished from law created by the enactment of legislatures, the common law comprises the body of those principles and rules of action relating to the government and security of persons and property which derive their authority solely from the usages, usages and customs of immemorial antiquity. And I do ask on your, on your own time that you look up those two terms, immemorial antiquity. Or from the judgments and decrees of the courts recognizing, affirming, and enforcing such usages and customs. And in this sense, particularly the ancient unwritten law of England.
Now, uh, it, does, it does give a little bit of a distinguishing factor from equity, which is going to be our next topic, and I'm going to read a little bit about this as well. As distinguished from equity law, it is a body of rules and principles, written or unwritten, which are of fixed and immutable authority. And I ask that you look up the term immutable as well. Which must be applied to controversies rigorously and in their entirety, and cannot be modified to suit the peculiarities of a specific case or colored by any judicial discretion and which rests confessedly upon custom or statute as distinguished from any claim or ethical superiority. And when they claim uh, claim or ethical superiority, they're talking also about uh, certain claims and rights that one may have that are absolute as opposed to enacted. So um, let's go into and segue to equity here in a moment. Did you have anything else to say about common law? Should I head back? If, yeah, if I might just draw a couple of, of conclusions about it or, or put forth a couple of ideas. Uh, common law, far preferable to code or statute, okay, because code and statute are legislative acts that turn into uh, the mess of code that, uh, that you know, lawyers lean on in our court systems and, it, that you know, they're part of the, part of the mess, okay. Common law is uh, based on what has come before, okay, and, and it, is, it is more of a law form than code or statute. It is a, it is truer to law, and in, um, uh, in, a, in a better, better place to be operating. If you're choosing jurisdiction to go into court, common law is great. Now the 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 issue with common law is the word rigor, which was in that definition, and it, it pops up in the equity definition probably too. In, in I'm guessing in. Uh, in distinguishing it from common law, the, the 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 issue with common law is that it is rigorous. It is entirely based on precedence, and judges have no room uh, to interpret, or very little to interpret the common law. Uh, it's it's all it's all pre decided. So it's who can figure out the bit the who can best match the current situation to past cases. Um, whereas equity, which is our next one, right? Mm -hmm. Equity is our next one. Equi I'm common law as well, too. Oh, you want to pull it up on Wiki? Okay. Um, sure. A common law system is a legal system that gives pre precedential weight to common law on the principle that it is unfair to treat similar... Uh, wait, I missed an entire line, didn't I? Law developed by judges through decisions of courts and similar tribunals. There's the basic definition, as opposed to legislative statutes, which are code, or executive branch action. So that's that's a pretty good cover of what common law is, and oftentimes it's a law. Um, what it had said before, immemorial, immemorial antiquity, meaning uh, something like a time before the memory or a time before the mind, a um, a time of antiquity or ancient memorial. So, um, uh, I would I would submit that natural natural law has been in existence from time immemorial. That is before before the, before human memory was developed. Natural law was still in play, mm -hmm. uh, was or was in, already in play, I should say. Um, and common law uh, is uh, goes back in, in into antiquity to find. Uh, what is right based on what has come before, and then code is just what the rules are today. And yeah. you know, typically you get a fairer shake if you can look at history and court decisions than if you just uh, succumb to the code. Nice. And then equity. Equity. Let's get our definition up. I believe this was. Yeah, let's define ideas. that one first. It's an interesting one. Equity deals with the rigor that we were talking about in common law, and you know sometimes common law is too rigorous. It it leaves no discretion for the judge to figure out what's fair. And um, you know if the case precedent precedents presented uh, leave no room for the judge to 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 even take in extenuating circumstances and and absorb what's really going on. Then there is a call for equity. 
So, uh, equity from Black's Law Fourth, in its broadest and most general signification, this term denotes the spirit and the habit of fairness, justness, and right dealing, which would regulate the intercourse of men with men, the rule of doing to all others as we desire them to do to us. So what we see as equity is literally the embodiment of the golden rule. Or as it is expressed by Justinian, to live honestly, to harm nobody, to render to every man his due. It is therefore the synonym of natural right or justice. But in this sense, its obligation is ethical rather than jural, and its discussion belongs to the sphere of morals. It is grounded in the precepts of the conscience, not in any sanction of positive law. And it's a very interesting aspect. So can we bring up the? Can we bring up the uh, the the wiki? I think wiki had a, a good uh, sort of history of it. Just bring up bring up wiki and go down go down scroll yeah, right down to history. The history of equity. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, would you like to go ahead and read that? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Equity was developed two or three hundred years after common law as a system to resolve disputes where damages are not a suitable remedy and to introduce fairness into the legal system. The distinction between law and equity is an accident of history. The law courts or courts of law were the courts in England that enforced the king's laws in medieval times. Here the king's judges, educated in law rather than theology, administered the universal law of the realm. This body of law evolved on the basis of previously set precedent into what is recognized as the common law of England. However, if changes were not quick enough, or if decisions by judges were regarded as unfair, litigants could still appeal directly to the king, who, as sovereign, was seen as the fount of justice and responsible for the just treatment of his subjects. Such filings were usually phrased in terms of throwing oneself upon the king's mercy or conscience. Eventually, the king began to regularly delegate the function of resolving such petitions to the chancellor, an important member of the king's council. The early chancellors were often clergymen or nobles, acting as the king's confessor, and thereby literally as keeper of the king's conscience. As a result of the theological and clerical training, Con chancellors were well versed in Latin and French. I don't need to go any further, I don't think. But that's where the court of chancery comes from, which is, is the old, old term for equity. And, uh, and so equity was, you know, when you couldn't get, uh, you couldn't get a, a, a modern decision, basically, or a decision that was specifically suited to your needs in, in the present day, because the decisions of the past were affecting your judgment uh, in the present day, you could go to the king or the chancellor and you could just throw yourself upon the mercy of the chancellor and, and say, I, you know, I just need fairness applied to this. Here's my situation. And you would get an equitable remedy. Well said. Well said. All right. So our next slide here. Private international law or conflict of laws. Now, uh, this is one that I should have up on Wiki, and I believe I don't. And we are going to use Wiki's definition because it's uh, it really is one of the better. Um, yeah, it's one that I don't have up right now. So give me just a moment. For those of you that private uh, international law and for those of you sorry. that don't know how to look anything up on Google, this is how you look something up on Google. are. The conflict of laws, also known as private international law, is a set of procedural rules that determines which legal system and which jurisdictions applies to a given dispute. The rules typically apply when a legal dispute has a foreign element, such as a contract agreed to by parties located in different countries or not located in the country that uh, is in question. Although the foreign element also exists in multi-jurisdictional countries such as the United Kingdom, the United States, Australia, and Canada. The term conflict of laws itself originates from situations where the ultimate outcome of a legal dispute depended upon which law applied and the common law court's manner of resolving the conflict between those laws. Now, if there was if there was a conflict of laws between a private contract trust, you know, private express trust under the common law, and say 
the jurisdiction of laws of the IRS, then we would understand that it would fall under a conflict of laws because our contract creates the law. And we'll get into that later. Maybe we should uh, try a discipline for ourselves from here on out of never mentioning the Internal Revenue Service again. Uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, the interesting part of this is the foreign element that it talks about. So, if your trust is foreign to the United States corporation and its laws, then the conflict of laws or private international law applies. And it is uh, certainly not a foregone conclusion that you could be drawn into a United States court of any sort. The jurisdiction um, of an organization like the IRS, the jurisdiction of a court system, and jurisdiction of the police um, does not exist uh, due to conflict of laws, due, due to private international law. I agree. I agree. Um, three branches. It has the three branches of conflict of laws down here. Jurisdiction, whether the forum court has the power to resolve the dispute at hand. Choice of law, the law which is being applied to resolve the dispute. And foreign judgments, the ability to recognize and enforce a judgment from an external forum within the jurisdiction of the adjudicating forum. We'll get into that in the future as well. Okay. Contract is law. Well, that kind of speaks for itself, doesn't it? Yeah, although it's not the same without Deepak singing it. Right, yeah. The, the private contract is king, and the reason that is is because the private agreement that you've created, uh, endowed by your unalienable rights with another party in private jurisdiction, as long as the other party is in that same private jurisdiction, the contract between those parties literally creates the law uh, separate of that would be, of course, natural law, but that contract is normally drawn to some extent under common law. And the reason being is there's a private contract existing between individuals outside of the jurisdiction of any other uh, government entity, and governing that would be the precedented laws of the land, which would be, of course, common law. And to regulate the rigorousness of that, equity would fall into play should there be any um, conflict of natural law in that agreement. So the contract is law. Every law form on this page, except for positive law, um, well, I guess a positive law too, no, except for statutory law, sorry, and code, all, all the other, the bullet point law forms on here play a part in, in, in interpreting uh, the operations of trust. Contract, be, natural law being probably the most important. Contract, being being uh, paramount uh, of the of the positive laws, the the man-made stuff, and uh, interpreting common law and equity uh, under the under private and international law terms. And you know, to some extent, it it even it even encompasses statutory law, whereby certain transactions you may make with as trustee of that trust. Uh, will be dictated whether you will or will not operate under a certain form of statutory law. And so we are always, we are always um, considering all of these law forms in every aspect of what we're doing in trust because there may, be some, there may be some laws or law forms we wish to omit, some law forms we wish to enforce or enact, and um, you know, there, there are some that we may not even know about. By the way, that brings me to, this is not all of the different kinds of law. There are many, many different forms of law. This is just some of the ones that apply to us for our uh, purpose of what we're teaching. So. All right. The United States Trust, also known as the federal government. All right. If we're going to give an example of a private express trust, we might as well give the big boy. Uh, United States Trust is one of the largest Um, Articles of Confederation. That was the first indenture. It created a trust by union of the several states. By several, uh, that, that definition used here is separate, okay, or individual uh, states. Uh, there are 50 several states today. There were 13 then, I believe. 
Articles of Confederation, page one, would be a great thing to look at. Uh, let's look at who the trust parties are. And I know we haven't really defined trust parties yet, but we're going to touch, touch on them here. We'll get to that. I think that's going to be webinar two. If I All right, so we have our preamble. We have our articles one, two, three, and four on page. Yep, article one um, gives a name. You're creating an entity, creating a person, okay, and giving it a name. The United States of America. Prior to that, uh, it was it was just the several states. Article two: Each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, independence, every power, jurisdiction, and right which is not by the confederation. This confederation expressly delegated to the United States. So, what are we doing? We're you know the people are granting certain rights and powers to the to to create a federal person the united states of america and in doing so retaining all of its sovereignty freedom independence and every power jurisdiction right which is not expressly given to the federal uh person the, the united states of america okay so that that sort of defines what the powers of the trustees are you're creating uh, or the question was, who are the parties? Well, you know, the people uh, created a state trust when they formed a government. And the state then in turn created a federal trust, the United States of America. So the trustees uh, are the United States of America, Congress, basically, that's being created. And the, the grantors settlers or trustors, which are all similar terms, are the people by way of their states. So really, the, it's the states that did this. Uh, and then the beneficiaries are the people, again, by way of the states. So I would say the beneficiaries are actually are the states and the people. Um, Article 3, firm league of friendship with each other for the common defense, security of their liberties, and their mutual and general welfare. Binding themselves to assist each other against all force offered to or attacks made upon them or any of them on account of religion, sovereignty, trade, or any other pretense, whatever. So these are the powers, these are this is a general article statement of the powers bestowed upon the trustees for this union, for this trust. Okay, let's take a look at uh, the Constitution because that's what came next. The Constitution replaced the indenture, which is the agreement of the trust that forms the trust. That's the, the paperwork, basically. Uh, the articles. Excuse me? The articles. Right, well, it, it replaced mm -hmm. the Articles of Confederation with the Constitution, new paper, okay? And the purpose of it was, quote, in order to create a more perfect union. Uh, it it did basically two things. It better defined the rights and powers given to the trustees, and uh, it increased those powers uh, based on a perceived need at the time. Uh, mostly of that perceived need was was uh, foreign in nature. It was international um, uh, uh, representation. How it was how the 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 colonies uh, you know came across to the rest of the world. They wanted to give the federal government. Uh, more power to represent the states. So, um, uh, section one, all da, 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 okay, so they defined more specifically to consist of a Senate and House of Representatives. Um, and and it just goes through it in much more detail than the, than the Articles of the Confederation. It says the House of Representatives shall be composed of members chosen every second year. No person shall be a representative who has not attained the age of 25. You know, so it, it's laying out in the Constitution what those, uh, how how the uh, uh, the indenture is going to work for this trust that's been created by the Articles of Confederation, and the most important thing to know about the Constitution Trust is that the Constitution does not grant you any rights. A lot of people think that's a crazy statement. That's where my rights come from. And no, the the, con the Constitution specifically limits the rights of the government. The Constitution is not where you get your rights. Your rights are God-given, 
unalienable, inherent in you as spirit. Your rights are your rights. And what the Constitution seeks to do is create a trust and limit the trustee's rights and duties specifically. It doesn't grant you any rights whatsoever. Never did. As you see what I have up here, it's section 9 and section 10. Of course, you see the limits on Congress, which uh, backs, of course, what you're talking about, limiting the power of the federal government by way of giving it specific powers and retaining the sovereignty of all other powers to the states for the benefit of the people. Um, and then we have, of course, powers prohibited of states. Down here, section 10. Um, there's, there's a really beautiful piece here that you'll see quoted throughout many private express trusts and many private contracts of that nature. And that is uh, section, t I'm sorry, Article 1, Section 10, which says, No state shall enter into any treaty, alliance, or confederation, grant letters of mark or reprisal, coin money, emit bills of credit, make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts, pass any bill of attainer, ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts, or grant any title of nobility. So are, are, you saying, are you saying that the government is not allowed to interfere with my contracts? Well, I mean, what we're talking about here is the limits placed on the federal government and the sovereignty being retained by the state for the people. And it seems to me that this is also protecting the people from the state as well. No state, including the United States, because it is a state under definition, not a uh, nation state. Well, it is a nation state even. Um, shall enter into a treaty or shall pass, if you skip all of that, go down to this semicolon right underneath, no state shall pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts. Now, that's a pretty clear and present statement that is protected by the Constitution. That means that our unalienable right to contract is protected even from the states. And the states are the ones that gave the power to the federal government. So it's definite that the federal government has no right. It is agreed by all the states that uh, that they, they have no right over your contracts. They, they can't impair your contracts. It's a very important section of the Constitution. And this has to do also with impairing the obligation of contracts of the government as well, which is an interesting thing. There's so many different factors in this, but we're going to focus on the major one at hand, which is our point is, is that we have the right to create our own contract, and they have an actual statement that limits their power to government. So, very powerful, very powerful. All right. Moving and on. by the way, although uh, it, it's so often uh, the case that that court cases and stuff seek to ignore that fact, your right to contract, your unlimited, uh, unalienable right to contract, and yet the Supreme Court decisions that come out on it are always the same. It exactly. always upholds the Constitution. That's exactly <laughs> so right. There's plenty, of, there's plenty of case law for, for a common law hearing on uh, regarding your contracts, you including know falls, your trust indenture. Well, it falls onto that old maxim, you know, he who fails to assert his rights has none. Right. Okay, the 13th Amendment. Uh, would you like to tackle this one? Sure. The 13th, 13th Amendment ended slavery after the Civil War. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as punishment for a crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Now the problem here is that the former slaves' woes are definitely not over by the 13th Amendment because simply freeing them did not make them citizens. So in 1868, after many more abuses to the former slaves, the United States passed the 14th Amendment uh, in order to afford former slaves adequate protection and privileges. So what it did, basically, is the 13th Amendment, Amendment ended slavery, but made no provision for who these people were. You know, and so the slave owners, the former slave owners, you know, just kind of kept treating them like slaves. Um, they might started paying them low wages or whatever, but there were no rights, benefits, privileges, anything recognized in this class of people. 
So the 14th Amendment, all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. Now this is tricky. A new type of citizenship was born, that of a citizen of the United States, which did not exist before. Okay, before there were citizens of the several states. You were a citizen of the state in which you reside, and the state was a member of the union. Okay, so or a, so when they created these United States citizens, we're talking about capital U, capital S. This is the United States Corporation. This is the this is the the uh, the organ. Well, it's today the United States Corporation, but it's the organization, a trust that we defined before. Basically, it's the District of Columbia uh, and its territories, which does not include any of the several states. It includes Guam and Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands and about 18 others and 19 others. So you be, they were making citizens, new citizens of this entity. Uh, the United States is essentially a fiction and creating fictions underneath it as citizens. Okay. So the two are synonymous, District of Columbia and the United States are synonymous. I guess you wanted me to move on to the next page, huh? Forgive me. <laughs> You've read the whole thing and commented on it. That's just, that's just the... I hadn't actually finished reading it. I, had, uh, I commented before I got to the last sentence. Please do. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, under the authority and pursuant to the 14th Amendment. I feel much... I feel com total, totally complete now. Thanks. No worries. One of the beauties of two of us running this. So. Okay, so here's what arises. Okay, so now you've got the state citizen, also known as the American citizen. Uh, by state citizen, we mean citizen of a several state within the American Republic. Okay, the original United States of America versus the 14th Amendment U.S. citizen, just created by the 14th Amendment. Uh, ostensibly to end to 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 end the 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 difficulty the slaves were having after the Thirteenth Amendment ended slavery, and make them citizens and make them equal, uh, but it didn't make them equal. It made a new class of citizenship. So we the people remain sovereigns as citizens of the several states with unalienable rights guaranteed and protected by the Constitution. The Fourteenth Amendment created a new class of citizens, with which we have subsequently joined voluntarily. The Supreme Court of the United States stated it this way, the rights of citizens of the states as such are not under consideration in the 14th Amendment. They stand as they did before the adoption of the 14th Amendment and are fully guaranteed by other provisions. Man, that is powerful. So we've got two classes of citizens. And chances are you on this call are both. And how you operate is... is is what determines uh, how you're treated, basically. Um, all right, I'm ready for the next slide. All right. <laughs> okay, so we have our hierarchy of powers, and um, this is what we see as the most powerful, the people. We, the people. The most powerful, the sovereign, the source of all power. We are endowed with our inalienable right to contract, to create, and um, we're protected. Those rights are protected by the Constitution. They protect our rights to liberty, life, the pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of private property, among many other rights and titles that we have. The state citizen, uh, we feel, is second in power um, due to the fact that the citizenship is a pledge, a pledge to a trust in exchange for benefits and privileges. And um, there's also a trusteeship that is involved, whereby you are trustee and beneficiary, and in some places, grantor as well, which is all legitimate in trust law. Um, they are second in power, I'm sorry, second in power, and they represent the sovereignty of the people by pledge. So when the state citizen steps up for the state, well, and we understand that the state has been granted certain powers by its state citizens. So that and, and certain powers, meaning not all powers, because all other powers remain in the sovereignty and the power of the people. We went over that already. 
up above or below, <laughs> however you see, is the United States, less powerful than the states and deriving its power from the states, meaning we see the succession of power and where it has been given to the trustees of the United States. Now, a trustee has the ability to do what it feels necessary for the benefit of the trust as long as it is within the scope of its declaration and constitution. Well, I believe that some of us beneficiaries have a right to call our trustee on his actions under breach of trust by way of violating certain forms of the Constitution. And, uh, you know, that, that comes to court all the time. And so that's just, you know, a basic, a basic breach of trust by the trustee that the beneficiary has a right to call them on and has a right to even claim that there be a new trustee in place. We'll get, into, get into that a little bit. A citizen of the United States, no true constitutional rights, derives its power from the United States. Well, that makes, that makes a fair amount of sense. So the constitutional rights are there to protect the several states, the union of states. So very interesting, very interesting. The constitutional rights are for the state citizen, That's not correct. for the citizen of the United States. That's correct. This is uh this 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 stuff is really well covered in um, both of the extra reading material. Uh, I think we didn't get the second one up on this slide, but you got the first one there. Story, greatest story never told by Albert Lynn Barcroft. Not primary reading for this uh, for this uh, webinar tonight, but I highly suggest that you read it if you're interested in the subject and want to know more. Um, that's a good read, and also the other one on there, uh, cooperative federalism, was added. Uh, today, I believe, uh, is another great read on this subject, and um, those are, you know, uh, I don't know, about, they're each about 40 pages, I think, um, but really, really good uh, description of this and, and, and citations of the source material as well. The Cooperative Federalism uh, uh, book is written by a law professor, but in tro total layman language, so it's a, it's a great uh, place to dig in for this information. The one thing I want to point out of this hierarchy of powers before we move on to the next slide is that um, it's really a limitation of powers that, that, that takes place. Okay, so as you start, you could actually go above the people and say there's spirit or God or, or you know, p p primordial energy or whatever. The, 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 as, as it passes down through this this chart of of, uh, of persons, okay? You've got the people, the people make the state citizens, the state citizens make the state by grant, the state makes the United States by grant, the United States makes the citizen of the United States by grant, okay? each In each case, there is a limitation of powers and a grant of powers. And uh, the only one that's got all the power is the people. And that's, you know, that that's the truth of the way things really lie. So which would you rather be? Would you rather be a state citizen or a, a United States citizen, a U.S. citizen? You can see it's just a filter process. The, the, the state citizen granted powers to the state, which granted to the United States, which granted, to this, which granted citizens of the United States. Um, confusing at first, but very important. And, and you know, it's an interesting thing that you say that. The private express trust often... Uh, if was, you know, looking for protection, falls under the category of state citizen. and is well, let's government. go to the next slide before you get into that. It and actually it falls under, it actually falls under more than that. It does, it does. There we are. No, okay, take, take out the bullet. Thank you. Uh, actually, we have a poll for this. There we go. Oh, we do. That's great. Where does a private express trust under the common law fit into the hierarchy of powers? What is it equal to, in other words? Can we see results? Can we see results? Ready. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
All right. Well, people are getting that the uh, uh, the power is in the people. Um, the answer is sort of a, it's it's sort of a trick question, to be honest. Um, the United States is a private express trust under the common law. The state is a private express trust under the common law. The citizen is a natural person. The the people are are natural persons. Um, I would say all of those are true. The only one that's not true, that it's not equal to is the US citizen. The US citizen is the is the is the the runt of the litter of this group. So yeah, I mean it's it's it depends on how you define people. If you're defining people as a as a, a portion of God, then then the this trust is not truly that, okay? It's it is it is an entity that's created by people. So I would put it right around the the power of the state citizen, uh, but it also is true that uh, that it is equal to or or above the United States and the state. So when the United States sues your trust, for example, um, assuming jurisdiction, uh, your answer in court is a 12b1 motion to dismiss for lack of jurisdiction. And unless they can prove that your trust is in their jurisdiction, there's no case, period. <laughs> there's no, it doesn't go any further. You don't even have to answer the complaint. You just put in a 12B1 motion and uh, set a motion date on your own time. And, and that motion must be heard. And unless they can prove minimum contacts, which is the, which is the, uh, uh, we're gonna we're gonna get into that. I mean, minimum contacts becomes key, but unless they can prove minimum contacts in their jurisdiction, then there is no case. That's correct. That's very good. All right. So, I'm assuming we got our results correct. Yeah. The trial, yeah. You saw it, didn't you? It was like 58 percent said the said the people. Is it was. Believe it or not, when I have this up, I can't see other items. So. Oh, weird. Okay. Well, I'll, we're showing screen right now. That's why. So. Well, everyone else sees that, though, right? Okay. Uh, the trust is a natural person that can sue and be sued and possesses the right to all enjoyments from any contract it enters into. It's very clear. The trust is governed by its indenture just as the United States is governed by its indenture or the Constitution. So we're seeing some definite similarities in the balance of power that exists in the private express trust versus the power that exists in the United States trust. Very interesting. One who creates a trust may mold it into whatever form he pleases, and whatever one may lawfully do himself, he may authorize another to do for him. Now, that's very clear and present. What that dictates is, just like it says, one who creates a trust can have any intention he pleases. And whatever they can do for themselves, they can enact into articles and bylaws that will allow the trustee to act on their behalf. Doing so requires no benefit, privilege, or franchise from any government or other outside party. Now, some of these have the uh, citing on the base. Um, I believe it was the last one that... that uh, the last two that were actually cited from those. Um, those sightings actually came uh, from Weiss's as well, and um, so did those some of those statements, although they were actually cited from the case themselves. Um, we do suggest, and that is the some of the reading material for the next uh, webinar is Weiss's Concise Trustee Handbook. That's a very powerful document. Before you go on here, let's look. Let's just talk about this for a second, because yep. I know that a lot of people on this call know about benefits, privileges, of franchise for any government. Um, they know what that means. Uh, there's a very important distinction between rights and benefits and privileges. And uh, the state citizen is endowed with rights. Okay, the state citizen is a, is a natural person with unalienable rights. The United States citizen is a fiction and is given benefits and privileges instead of rights. 
um, it's like the Wizard of Oz. The the you know the, <laughs> they get a badge of of courage and in, in, uh, instead of actual courage. Uh, you you know the uh, um, the the federal jurisdiction, the federal government. Uh, is 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 a fiction all the way through the the citizen that's created and that ostensibly gave the slaves a a way to operate um, became the problem um, and we opt into it by our parents filling out a birth certificate by our uh, application to a social security card to get a social security account by the use of that social security number every time we use it. Uh, we're raising our hands and saying, yes, we want to be United States citizens. Keep treating me like a fiction. Keep treating my, me like, uh, like, a, like I'm the all capital letters spelling of my name that goes on the driver's license that I don't really need because the Constitution allows for the, the right to travel. Well, I have a, an unalienable God-given right to travel. And the Constitution limits the powers of the government, uh, not allowing them to restrict my travel. So I have unlimited right to travel on the roadways of America, and yet the states that that, that sort of the state citizen—that's me—but uh, the the United States citizen needs a driver's license because that's a benefit, that's a privilege, it's not a right for this for the United States citizen. So we're used to operating in an environment where uh, where all of our rights have been taken away, and instead we have liberty. And liberty is a nautical term. It uh, it has to do with shore leave. Liberty is when you are free, but only until someone jerks your leash back to the back to the boat, and then you're under the iron rule of the captain again. Okay, so liberty means you are you are as free as we want you to be. F freedom is freedom. Liberty is temporary freedom or freedom with restrictions. And so we want to get out of the realm of liberty, benefits, and privileges. Stop being a franchise of the government, which is what the U.S. citizen is, and operate from a higher position in the hierarchy of powers. I just wanted to... Uh was something out of uh, Weiss's Concise that uh, talks a little bit about the natural person. We're talking about here the Declaration, and uh, we're getting close to the edge here, so we're gonna, I'm just going to read this out. Moreover, the Declaration, also known as the Constitution in this, uh, in this moment, by its terms and provisions, serves to establish the entire contractual arrangement, including the identities and positions of the parties, the trust's name, jurisdiction and situs, and all particulars of administration, all of which the courts of equity will fully support by the principle that equity compels performance. The ultimate result is the creation of a bona fide legal entity with its own separate and distinct juridical personality, withstanding to sue and be sued, as we covered, and to function as a person, which we'll look up in a moment, in commerce, by and through its trustees, meaning it is a natural person in commerce by and through its trustees. The term natural person has been applied to express trust by courts of equity because of its administration being carried out by men acting as natural persons. And we're going to get into a little more of that and the natural person and, of course, the definition of persona, um, mostly into the second webinars where we're going to be getting into a lot of that. Um, we could cover the definition of person right now. I do have it up on, uh, on etymology if we wanted. Yeah, let's do that. Let's, 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 uh, let's do cover person because it's a tricky word that some people on this call have got down. Uh, others may not even know that it is what it is. Yeah. And uh, we, I believe that is the one that I'm missing out on uh, Black's Law, but I can look it up pretty quickly. So. This is our etymology. This is etym online, like we spoke of. Um, early, early 13th century, it was known as human being. And you can see it uh, start to change slowly throughout time. Originally, character in a drama mask, possibly borrowed from Etruscan Persia, mask. This may be related to Greek Persephone, 
the use of person to replace man in compounds and avoid alleged sexist connotations is first recorded in 1971. So in person or by bodily presence is from the 1560s. So there's, there's a different term for person all throughout time. Now, with Black's Law Fourth, we're oftentimes around the beginning of the 19th century, uh, I'm sorry, the beginning of the 20th century, end of the 19th century, around 1890 to 1905. Um, there's also a definition underneath person that covers persona, an outward or social personality. Um, Jungian psychology term from person used earlier in the sense of literary character representing the voice of the author. Now we'll be covering that a little more uh, throughout Weiss's next, in a, in a couple of weeks in this next webinar because there's a beautiful piece that describes the theater, the persona, the mask, and the person and how they all connect to each other. And we do suggest that you read that as some of your, um, that is homework and reading material for the next webinar as well. So we hope that you'll be up to date on that when we talk about it. Isn't it interesting how, uh, leave it there for a moment, see how uh, you mentioned that uh, the sexist connotations were avoided by, by uh, in 1971, people started calling person instead of man. What's interesting is that man is people. Man is human, right? And so is woman, but person is not. Person, at least, is not necessarily. Man is always man, but person is bringing a level of fiction, a mask, okay, uh, a persona to the situation. The um, Bank of America is a person. The United States is a person. I'm a person too, but I'm a different kind of person. I'm a natural person, okay? And more importantly, I'm one of the people. I'm a man. So this dangerous slip is very similar to you know trying to do the right thing you see how this leg legislation goes through or this this convent this uh trend goes goes ahead legislation i'm talking about is freeing the slaves and giving them a, a, a citizenship it sounds like a great idea let's give them equality but it didn't and here when the 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 feminist movement started to really take hold and people realized that you know man is sexist potentially then person was the was the word that unfortunately started being used and what it did was it stripped men and women from being referred to as people and and instead started referring to you as a fiction just like the 14th amendment citizen it strengthened the 14th amendment citizenship clause so much and it's unfortunate. And I think we're uh, drawing to an end, are we? Yes. Now, are, are we still doing basic definitions in this one, or is that the next well, one? Well, this is to get some people ready for next Oh, week. this is, yeah, right, okay, this yeah, is this is homework, is what this, this is. is home. Yeah, we, we, put, we posted just a few basic definitions. We went through a lot of words, did a lot of defining today, and we did a lot of history and a lot of introduction to the basis of our, uh, the jurisdiction we'll be talking about, and um, all aspects of um, you know a good example of what a trust is an operating trust is at this time. Why don't you throw them all up there and let people just jot them down? These are good, these are the definitions for next time, and obviously they're not the only definitions, but they're ones that uh, you know want you to have a good working understanding of uh, through Black's Law, through Wikipedia, um, whatever other resources you want to use. But also the homework is going to be pretty descriptive of it as well, which is going to be Weiss's Concise Trustee Handbook. Uh, I think an invaluable resource, although not a source material resource, uh, a very uh, well cited, um, that is he cites well the source material and, uh, and, and his, and we've, you know, we and many others have, have, have looked very carefully at his material and, and find it to be accurate. So we find it a trusted source. Weiss is concise is the homework. Here are the here are the main terms that we're gonna be starting with next time. And we also ask that um, you know that hopefully you took some notes throughout this and hopefully you did um, write down some of the words. We ask that you go back through some of the words that we covered and you um, expound on the definitions that we covered so that you can fully understand uh, what we did cover because this was this is really our introduction and from here on out we're not going to be 
uh, spending as much time um, in history or in in uh, in roundabout things, we'll be getting very direct, uh, very narrow in our definitions and very narrow in our um, aspects of study too. So yeah, th this th this session became. Uh, like I said when we opened, more about defining a problem or defining a, uh, an operating environment. And uh, hopefully we've given you some stuff to think about between the, re the reading and the, and the material on this webinar. Um, I, think, uh, I think we're, uh, we're going to wrap this in a moment and uh, take a little break after and then, and then have some questions. And uh, let's bring up the, the, the conclusion uh, slide. So. so, in conclusion, love all, trust a few, do wrong to none. That's a good old Bill said that. When a man assumes a public trust, he should consider himself a public property. That's just fair warning from Thomas Jefferson. He saw it back then. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was fair yeah. warning. Go ahead. Civilization is the progress toward a society of privacy. The savage's whole existence is public, ruled by the laws of his tribe. Civilization is the process of setting man free from men. It's very poignant. Gotta love Ayn Rand. The secret to success is to own nothing but control everything. Famous mm -hmm. quote, John Rockefeller. That's right. You must be the change you wish to see in the world. Our good friend Gandhi as well. And that's a good one to leave with because ultimately, you know, the intention of the party is the soul of the instrument. We'll be covering that and it's, it's important that you all have an intention as to why not only you've joined uh, this group, but why it is that you have the interest and you choose to operate the way that you do in trust. And uh, it's going to be a big reflection on your inner life, um, the things around you, your environment, and how you operate. And hopefully in the end of this we'll, we will have given you a view, per, you know, a different skew different perspective on how one can operate in all aspects of commerce. Awesome. 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 Great. Okay, let's take it let's take a five minute break. Um, stretch, you know, go to the bathroom, whatever you need to do, get a new drink. Um, uh, you could even make it a hard alcohol drink at this point because we're just going to take some questions and wrap this up. Uh, uh, what's our timing in this? Where are we in the process? We're about, we're about five before eight now. We're just before two hours? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, let's take a break. Uh, five minutes, we'll come back at, uh, let's just say eight o'clock Pacific time, 11 o'clock Eastern. Or, uh, and yes, and then we'll take questions and we'll start by going back through these questions. So if you have, you know, take your break. Don't write your questions during the break. You'll have time to write them afterwards or whatever. Not, just so we're clear, that's the only way we're receiving questions is by uh, is by writing, correct? At least on this webinar, because we had so much we wanted to cover foundational stuff. And I'm, you know, when I come back, I'm going to start going through these questions that we haven't answered in line. Great, great. Okay, cool. Five minutes. Five minutes.